Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you taking some time out to join us tonight. Um, we have um, had so much interest in our No Mo May um, webinar uh, that uh, this last month we decided that we wanted to bring in another perspective. Uh, so we have folks from Appleton, Wisconsin here to talk about what they've, their experiences with No Mo May. Um, so, as before we get started, I just wanted to let you guys know that you have a chat available. So feel free to share your no mo or low mo stories, what you're you've been up to in your area. Um, and then we have a Q and A as well, so you can uh, ask us some questions. And after the presentation, we'll have an extended time for questions and answers. So feel free to um, enter those questions at any time. And um, Nick, we'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. Um, first of all, I should say I'm Laura Ross. I'm the coordinator of B City USA and B Campus USA for the Xerces Society. And um, we have Matthew Shepard with us, um, the, our director of outreach and education at Xerces. Um, and we're here to, we're basically, we're just background today to help out, but um, our, I'll introduce our hosts. We have, or our panelists, we have Alex Schultz, uh, Executive Director of Sculpture Valley, a nonprofit advocacy group for public arts um, in Fox Valley. He is an alder person with District 9 in Appleton, Wisconsin, and serves as the co-chair of the Paul Enablers Fox Cities group since its inception, and they kind of oversee the B-City activities for Appleton. Uh, we have Israel Del, Del Toro, uh, PhD. Uh, he is an associate professor at Lawrence University, and his research focuses on the ecology and conservation of social insects. And we have a bonus presenter, <laughs> panelist, Relena Ribbons, who is an assistant professor of geosciences at Lawrence University. So um, once again, feel free to chat, ask us questions on, in the Q&A as well, um, but I will go ahead and let them take it from here. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Really appreciate you guys hosting and facilitating this. Uh, this is probably the biggest audience we've had on, on you know, we're, we're able to reach uh, to answer questions about Nomo May. Uh, so we put together a quick little uh, presentation that we shared maybe about a week and a half ago at our city council. Uh, I, along with uh, Alex, both serve on the Appleton Common Council, um, and we, yeah, I actually got looped into Common Council through working with No Mo May and a lot of our uh, pollinator conservation advocacy. So, um, yeah, let me just share my screen here real quick, and we'll get underway. Okay. And... All right, folks. Um, yeah, should you have any questions after today, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. I'll type in my contact info or contact info in the chat as soon as we're done. Um, but you can reach me at um, israel.deltoro at lawrence.edu. Relena is... Relena.r.ribbons at lawrence.edu. Very excited. Alex, District what, 9? <laughs> District 9 at appleton.org. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, we'll make sure you guys have that information available should you have any follow-up questions and want to chat some more about Nomo May and what it's looked like here in the city of Appleton. So let me just start off by giving you a little bit of history of why we do this. And the general idea of Nomo May in the city of Appleton really started back in 2020. So Relena and I used to live back in Wales um, well, where Relena was doing her PhD, and we first encountered Nomo May as an initiative of a group called Plant Life in the UK. Uh, we thought it was very interesting. Um, they were focused really on native plant biodiversity more than anything else, thinking about what native plants might pop up if you just didn't mow your lawns, what was in the seed bank, really. And um, we immediately saw that this could be a possibility and an opportunity to really benefit our local poll pollinators, because a lot of these native species that would pop up would be excellent forage for early emerging pollinator species. And so when we moved back to Appleton, Wisconsin, back stateside in 2017, uh, eventually by 2020, uh, the year of our big pandemic, we decided to give this a shot. Uh, this was an opportunity to get people outdoors after being cooped up indoors for so long during the 2020 pandemic. And 
uh, not just get people doing tidy projects around the house, but rather get people engaged in observing nature in their backyards. Um, so this is exactly what Nomo May, where the Nomo May motive came when it comes to the stateside sort of things. Um, we really wanted to use Nomo May as a platform for community education and realize that it's not, Nomo May isn't really about your law. It's more about the native flowers and the native species and the little things that we can do or not do to promote our pollinator conservations in our own backyard. So instead of thinking like really big statewide initiatives or really big nationwide initiatives, which are absolutely necessary, we wanted people to have an opportunity to say, here's what I can do in my 2000 square foot lot or my 5000 square foot lot or my half acre. And Nomo May seemed like a logical place to start. Um, Nomo May gives us the platform for community education and stewardship and conservation of biodiversity. And we really wanted to base this on transparent scientific data. Uh, so we decided to meet up with folks like Alex and start to introduce this ordinance to our city and let them, you know, essentially we asked the city to let us experiment with people's lawns for that first year. And the experiment worked out pretty well. Um, I want to point out that uh, the first Nomo May paper, uh, Nomo May, was published in Pier J, and this was a very intentional choice. Pier J is an open access journal, which means that everybody in the world that has an access to uh, a computer and an, and an internet connection can download this copy of this paper, but not just the paper. You can get a hold of the data. You can get a hold of all of the peer review comments associated with this paper. You can get a hold of earlier drafts of this paper before we made changes based on the reviewer commentary. And we really like this platform because it really highlights the transparency of the scientific process. So we see this as a strength of the Nomo May paper. Having said that, we also recognize that there were original there were weaknesses in the 2020 design. Uh, one of the big criticisms, well, before we get into the criticisms, let me show you what uh, the 2020 design or study uh, first revealed. Uh, here we see four key graphs of this main paper. On the x-axis, we have our two treatments, unmowed areas, which we use city parks as our control, uh, because we knew that the mowing frequency at those city parks was going to be about once weekly. And then we used our non-mowed areas, where we asked participants not to mow their lawns. And at the end of the month, we decided to go ahead and sample uh, the bee biodiversity and ab abundance in these yards. We sampled about 30 yards in the city of Appleton. That first year, I think we had maybe 450 participants or so in this throughout the city uh, that registered and were participating actively in Nomo May. Out of those, we selected 30 and we went over a period of one week and sampled the bee biodiversity in their backyards and the floral diversity in their yards. And what we essentially found in this paper is that the floral abundance and the floral cover were significantly higher in Nomo lawns relative to mowed lawns, anywhere from three to five times higher. What this translated to was also an increase in bee abundances. So we noticed about a five-fold increase in bee biodiversity abundance or bee, number of bees present in these yards. And we also noticed about what we estimated to be about a three-fold increase in species richness. Now, having said that, there were some uh, criticisms of this uh, of this no uh, or this first no moan paper. And first was that they were comparing city parks to people's yards. They're not equivalent in area size. You can imagine a city park being much larger, and we know that area has a significant effect on the number of species present. Uh, and we also know that uh, individual yards might have different histories or treatments as associated with them. The other big criticism that we got from this 2020 paper was that because it was an effort to conserve bees, the last thing we wanted to do was harvest bees. So as a social insect biologist, when I go into the field, my first thing that I like to do to quantify biodiversity is unfortunately to kill everything and bring it back with me to the lab. We didn't want to do this with this project because it seemed counterintuitive. We don't want to go do science to save and protect our bees but at the same time, sacrifice and kill many bees. So what we did is we captured insects uh, using nets 
And we did our best to identify them as low to a low as toxin, a taxonomic uh, level as possible in the field. We estimate that using this method, uh, there we've got anywhere from two to three times higher richness, or that is number of species, in, in NOMO areas relative to mode areas. Now, this was questioned by members of the public, other scientists, saying, oh, you can't really tell the difference between this bee or that bee. Uh, so since then, Relena and I have been going back and redoing these analyses at a coarser taxonomic level because we can tell the differences between genera pretty easily, pretty consistently, and pretty accurately. So that's where our next analysis is going. All right. Uh, any questions here so far? Let's see what do we have. Uh, how many people live in Appleton? Appleton is about a 70,000 uh 70 75,000 population we are a little bit of a broader metropolitan area so we have uh cities of Manasha, Oshkosh, Nina all around us and collectively we're probably around 200,000 people um with all of the fox cities that are are in the area um what else? if you were looking for percentage of participation in the first and second year the first year was around 450 which is roughly I mean, I don't know what the percentage is. Point five percent, about point five. But when we went out uh, and anecdotally surveyed the communities to see who was mowing and not mowing their lawns, there were far there was a far greater number of people who are participating passively by not mowing, but not registered on our site. So these this registration for the first second year uh, was done as a you know a, a voluntary registration on the site to say, look, I'm going to actively let you know that I'm participating in Nomo May, but there was roughly, I mean, I guess we would guess probably 20, 30% of the city participating, uh, even though many of those people didn't actively go on the site and register. So uh, generally speaking, if, if you pass this in your uh, municipality, you can expect 20, 30% of the population to either actively or passively participate the first year, and then they'll kind of watch and see what happens with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And the second year, you'll probably see that increase by 10, 15%. And uh, how do we gain the support of our city council? I think a big part of that story was just talking to people about the science. What we knew before even going out there and collecting that first year's worth of data, we wanted to highlight the importance of pollinator conservation. We wanted to highlight the opportunity for a broad community outreach and education effort. And again, no mow may isn't just about not mowing your lawn. I'm going to like reiterate this till the point you're sick and tired and hear of me here and say that no mow may isn't about mowing, not mowing your lawn. That's the least you can do. We want you to think about opportunities of what you can do with that time that you get back. Let's say you spend an hour a week mowing your lawn on a regular summer day. Instead, why don't we spend that hour planting natives or restoring habitat or reducing our chemical and herbicide use. And those are all real parts and parts and initiatives of the community outreach and education effort of what no, falls in under the No Mo May umbrella. Um, so Ivy made a comment early in the session here about uh, whether the flowers would be behind because of the weather. Mm. I'm not sure if they'll still be there for No Mo June. Mm. I think that sort of broaches on the topic of what's appropriate because in, in Appleton, at least normal May seems to work, you know, depending on the seasons, we might want a normal late April. <laughs> um, but every community across the United States has to do with slightly different conditions, circumstances, and, and weather. And it not normal May is not always appropriate. So, you know, across the the continental United States, we've introduced this normal May initiative, but for some people, it may be more appropriate to do a normal April or normal June. Uh, and these conversations are evolving and maybe it, 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 it morphs into something like a slow mo spring where we open up the timing. So we're not locking it into these 30 days, which are, you know, somewhat arbitrary for communities that don't quite fit into that 30 day May narrative. And, and even where it works for us, we we're already into a couple of weeks from May or a week from May and, and we don't want people mowing right now. Right. And if you get out and start mowing last week of April, you're kind of defeating, the you're defeating the purpose. So we might have a, a normal May established in Appleton and we're going to have individuals out there. Oh, I don't have to worry about May, but I think I'm going to mow quick in because April, it's not too. normal May April and I'll just knock down the stuff right. last week of April. Um, and that defeats the purpose. So I think this, it, it really brings about the next conversation that we've got to get to, which is what does this thing look like yeah. 
more longer. with a more nuanced long-term approach that, you know, there is this no main initiative, but we're going to have to, ch- I think we're going to have to evolve that narrative so that it fits a little bit better with uh, communities across the United States, which might be a slow-mo spring or some other or slow mo summer and Berlin has actually been working on the slow mo summer and coordinating quite a few uh, bee conservation labs across the United States and getting us all to work together uh, on on practices to really extend just not beyond not just to move beyond no mo May into a slow mo summer or a low mo summer where we're really uh, being conscious of when we when we choose to to use this mowing practice. And you're going to get asked why mowing is so important or, or destructive to bee populations. And the first thing is it disturbs ground nesting bee populations. Um, we think that many, well, we know that many of our native bee species are ground nesters, and they will take an opportunity to nest and burrow in some of spaces, uh, sometimes people's lawns, areas adjacent to people's lawns. And uh, by mowing, you're really disturbing what's going on there. The second purpose is to allow those er early foraging resources to become available. We know dandelions aren't the best. They're not the filet mignon for for our beef. They might be a McDonald's burger, but when you're coming out of hibernation, that McDonald's burger looks really, really good. Okay, And it might be cheap calories, but there's enough of them to really get the populations off to a good start. And I want to turn it over to Relena to maybe talk a little bit about the 2021 study. You want to do that? Well, then I think there's another question ah, about that. There's lots, but do you yeah. want to move the presentation off of anything or go back to? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, if we're done with that part of it. Yeah, let me um, go ahead and go with, yeah, the 2021 study. Yeah, so we designed a follow-up study in 2021 where we aimed to take those reviewer comments about the fundamental study design comparison of control. So previously we used these parks that have a regular mowing intensity, uh, but in the 2021 study, we asked participants to find a neighbor who had a regularly mowing kind of um, schedule and do these paired comparisons. So you have lawn A, which is a no mow lawn and a neighboring lawn that's directly adjacent to it, it's, it's paired comparison. And, and that was great because then you have these direct um, equal comparisons between neighboring size, neighboring houses that have similar size lawns. And there's a less of a confounding effect in terms of kind of the science behind how we look at analyzing those, those B composition differences. Uh, but, but it also meant that we had this additional layer of engaging more people in the process. So again, continuing that citizen science data collection initiative which is also really important to kind of our mission behind No Mome in general. Um, so we had, across three we, we also expanded to three cities. So we were working in Oshkosh, Wausau and Appleton. Um, and we had a total of, was it 71 sites? 78 sites. Yeah. 78 sites. Um, and so this meant that we had larger geographic range. So kind of testing whether or not this works across the Wisconsin area. But also importantly, trying to figure out if those initial patterns are reproducible um, over a, a second growing season. So we're really excited to follow this up in the 2021 study. Yeah, and I think what this really gives us is uh, really good science. And again, going back to the transparency of the science, you know, our 2020 study is flawed in some ways. It has not imperfect methods, but that's a lot of science out there. You know, nobody hits it out of the park on their first on their first at bat. Uh, we really wanted to, to go out there and get some baseline data. And it turns out that that baseline data holds up even in 2021. So just looking at some of the results from the 2021 study, uh, here are the benefits. Obviously, uh, we noticed across the three different um, the three different uh, cities, we saw a total of 37 different bee species sampled. We again counted diversity and abundance, and we included diversity of additional insect groups. So not just bees, but other pollinators too. Flies, for example, are excellent pollinators that are often overlooked. Uh, Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths were collected in this study. Beetles were collected in this study. And everything else that was bycatch and yellow pan traps were also collected and, identif- and identified in the study. And just to give you a summary of this data, here's the floral abundance between mowed and unmowed areas over four weeks in May in 2021 across three cities. So the different lines represent three different cities. The x-axis is the four weeks of May. And the y-axis is the average number of flowers found per no-mow lawn plot in a meter squared. And we see that 
this can range from three to 10 times higher in no mow lawns. What that translate to, translates to is a broader insect abundance and diversity across these unmowed areas relative to the, relative to the mowed areas. So here we have three side-by-side -side bar plots with no mow versus mowed treatments. And these are the total insects that were collected. In 2021, we did harvest specimens because that was one of the big critiques of 2020. It's like you don't have a voucher specimen for an observed species, but now in 2021, we do, um, which is unfortunate, but again, done in the name of science and understanding uh, what biodiversity patterns actually look like. And I love this graph because it's really simple. I actually don't need any statistics here to show you that the no mode treatment has a significant effect on the abundance of major insect groups of uh, pollinators like flies, bees and wasps, and other pollinator uh, groups. So what I love about this graph is it's really simple to understand, and we really see the big increase of insects using these unmowed spaces during the month of May. Any other comments on the science stuff? No, I, I think this is uh, this is a great way to kind of visualize the different components of No Mo May was kind of starting this social experiment that we've seen kind of explode across the United States. Starting that conversation, it is not the be all end all, uh -huh. but you should be thinking about things like reduced chemical use, um, increasing public education about like, having good signs to indicate why you're doing a No Mo May or a slow mo summer, um, but ultimately thinking about larger connections to things like habitat conservation, water conservation and water quality concerns that all kind of tie together. Um, and I think there's there's a, a, an, another question maybe about one of the slides. Did someone want to see something? Alex? No, I was just hoping- to Oh, get stop back the to share? The screen, yeah, I oh. think we're, we're there. Okay, okay. cool. So we get back to. Yeah. No, I just, I was hoping to just, respond to some of the comments that are being shared as we as we move along here and get in you know the deep science of it uh and and a lot of these comments are essentially you know what do we do next and why not like no more year round or why is it no more may versus no more spring and i think that's that that's kind of the next stage of where this conversation needs to go so this this no more may initiative is really a a, a starter starting point it's a it's a first step and it's we put our stake in the ground here in Appleton and say, okay, what happens if we do this? Let's see what happens over a couple of course of a couple of years, mm -hmm. how many people participate and what it means. And, and I, you know, all the science is there to support this, but really, if you think about it, it's just like a super elementary notion in education. If you let nature be nature, it's going to do more nature, right? So if you just leave your lawn alone, it's going to be more natural and, and do more things that are going to support nature. So how does that work when we're trying to uh, work with city ordinances and things that say we've got to mow uh, and keep your lawn at a certain height year round? Um, and that's kind of the challenge that we're facing. Like, what do we do uh, as a municipality where we have uh, set lawn heights for every uh, throughout the season? Um, how do you how do you adjust that? And so, I think normal May is a starting point, um, but it leads us to deeper conversations about, okay, what can we do with our yards that doesn't conflict with current ordinances, which might tell us that we have to keep them at eight inches or less. Uh, and then, you know, kind of reduce what can happen where you have neighbor to neighbor conflict where one neighbor loves their four inch lawn and they're out there twice a week mowing it and putting fertilizers and uh, herbicides and pesticides on it. And you don't want to do that. And, and I think that's the challenge of moving the initiative forward, trying to figure out what that nuance is. And everyone has a different yard. Everyone's lawn grows slightly differently. Uh, I haven't touched mine for 20 years. I can let mine go for, as some of these people are suggesting in the comments, I can let my lawn go for four or five weeks and it's not an issue. I even, even at that, I'm not violating city ordinance, but another person, my neighbor might uh, have been fertilizing and putting uh weed and feed on his lawn for the last 20 years. So his lawn's going to grow like mad if he doesn't manage it for the month of May and he might find himself a 20 inch grass that he's got to clip and that's going to be a problem for him he's going to you know have a challenge with his lawnmower he's going to have to figure out where to go with the grass clippings if he puts them on the lawn and leaves the grass clippings there he might be creating you know wet habitat for Japanese beetles for existence for example so 
uh, like I say, every every uh, individual who wants to participate has a nuance that has to have a nuanced approach to their lawns. Um, and I, I think there's also a question here about concerns of that tall grass itself. You know, we've we've had questions like, what about deer ticks? Uh, what about uh, mice and rodents? Uh, during that first 2020 year, uh, Relena and I did a few blanket samplings uh, where we basically drag a white blanket across a lawn. And we see how many deer ticks are and, and ticks attached to those. And there were no significant difference be differences between mowed and unmowed areas. As for mice trappings, I tried to do a little bit of that in 2021. My sample size was relatively low, but I still don't really see a significant difference. Another question said, why was there an obvious difference between the three cities? And that's purely sample size. We just had more sampling sites here in, in Appleton than we did in the other two cities. And the, the numbers that you saw there were cumulative sums of insects. Uh, if we did a plot of, may, uh, of average number of insects collected per house, there'd be no significant differences across the three different cities. So in general, what we're seeing is an in, in, increase in at least abundances of insects using these, these places. And along with that come the beneficial insects. And I just want to like uh, put an exclamation on that this notion that really what this is about is what we said before is just like uh, you know when when the lawns are emerging in the spring period whatever that happens to be wherever you are living the idea is to just kind of let things um, come to life as you know giving them some space to do that so whether you uh, you know prevent yourself from getting the lawnmower out early in April even though you might be participating in participating in no mow may that's what you want to do you want to keep the, a minimal amount of uh, intrusion and essentially working over your lawn before you've allowed sort of nature to do its thing and, and to awake and allow all the insects that might be uh, overwintering under the leaves and under the ground uh, to come alive and kind of establish themselves before you get out there and, and mow your lawns. And then once you do establish your lawnscapes, it's not just about waiting a month and then mowing it. It's about kind of rethinking keeping an eye on it if you're if you've been uh managing your lawn uh to be a, a, a pretty significant green space and monoculture you may want to mow it after a couple of weeks and keep it down because maybe that that landscape is not doing the, the most beneficial thing for bees but if you're doing the opposite thing where you're not touching it for a few weeks you don't really have to do anything so it really again it really comes down to a uh an individualistic nuanced approach to your lawn understanding what you have out there. Honestly, if you're over eight to 12 inches, by the second week in May, you might as well mow it and collect the clippings and try and uh, you know increase the potential for other low growing uh, flowers like clovers and whatever else might be growing in your lawn. To, yeah. And we want you to use this time to rethink a little bit, right? Uh, and think it's like, okay, well now you've got extra time on your hands and really reevaluate what, you, what your objective is with your lawn. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you want, if your objective is to help native biodiversity and restore key ecosystem services like pollination, then we have to think about doing going beyond the NOMO. Okay? Uh, NOMO is a starting point. It's by no means intended to be the end point. This is not the only thing that you can do to help the bees. This is a starting point, a very, very low bar for helping our pollinators. Next is, okay, now let's consider what our native flowers in my area look like. What do native pollinators look like? Which species are threatened or endangered? Here in Wisconsin, for example, we have the rusty patch uh, bumblebee <laughs> of which like before, <laughs> I don't wanna attribute it to Nemo May, but when we started looking co closer in 2021, we actually found a population of rusty patch bumblebee here in, in, in the, right in the middle of city center. Um, so it's those types of things of like, how can I promote habitat for all of these species along the way in a way that uh, the NOMO is just your way in, your starting mm -hmm. practice. Right. It's really an easy entry way into having this conversation, even talking with your neighbors. If you're in an area that has a homeowners association, talk about what it is that you're trying to get out of your lawn. Like what is the function of that lawn? And maybe having a central park space if you're in a homeowners association area, a central park space that has a tightly managed turf so that everyone else's lawns can become these different kind of experimental units covering with things like clover and, and other legumes or, or beautiful violets that are wonderful and serve different functions. So kind of evaluating again, what's what's right for you in your area. About the, the low mow summer. 
Yes, so um, there's some additional initiatives kind of on the evolution of, of NOMO May to, to working towards either LOMO or SLOMO summer. Um, and this is a collaborative efforts that everyone is welcome to join in on actually is, is kind of continuing to say, okay, it's, it's now June. What are the best practices for this time of year in your area? And it might be a, a time that you finally have some native plants that are blooming. So great, you can turn your energy and initiatives towards um, kind of long-term planning for your lawn to, to try to overseed or to transition your lawn into something that requires less frequent maintenance. So having these low-mo species of grasses integrated into your lawn um, or even converting it entirely into other types of, of low-mo mixtures that allow you to have this kind of like you're slowing down the mowing process in the summer and, and making sure to um, adhere to good mowing practices as well in terms of the like cutting back only a third of the height. Um, again, lawn care professionals are actually, that's there's a cohort where we can kind of coalition build together to coming up with ways to care for these new lawnscapes. This is really like a market opportunity for, for lawn care professionals to jump on board with this movement of of, of getting these new bee lawn mixtures out there. And some of these are not that new, right? The, the research has been out there for a little bit, but now that it's, it's much more popular to engage with something like no mow may or bridge that into slow mow summer and, and thinking more about how you can conserve your resources uh, locally and, and talking with local professionals about that too. I think that's the, one of the narratives we're trying to move into is <clears throat> providing options for people who are like, okay, I, I love this no mow may thing, but if I let my lawn grow, it just doesn't look good. It's unsightly. Uh, I kind of want to do something different. So one of the things we're doing in Appleton this year, we're trying uh, a fresh uh, experiment essentially is to, to try out a few different varieties of slow-mo low -mo seed mixes to see if there's something uh, that works for us regionally and that we can recommend to any residents. It's like, you know, I'd really like to replant some of my lawn to be a no-mo or at least a slow-mo option versus maybe what is mostly Kentucky bluegrass around here. Uh, in a monoculture lawn. So providing some options and saying, here's what you might do as an alternative to that lawn. The other thing we have to consider, and which is like the case in most communities, is if you provide a visual cue, a visual cue as a separation between your lawn and what is not lawn, essentially if you mow a strip of uh, lawn between the sidewalk and your property, and you can say that's the lawn, everything else is no longer lawn, that's my pollinator habitat. And it can be as simple as mowing a strip. It can be a little bit more complicated. You can put up a little fencing, put up some signs, but all you really need to do is provide some visual cues to say, okay, this is my lawn. It might be the terrace between the street and the sidewalk. And then another little strip between the sidewalk and my property, my property in proximity, proximity to my house. But from that point on, this is pollinator habitat. You can put a sign on there that says this is pollinator habitat. And the vast majority of municipalities have this, uh, language on their books. Ordinance will uh, allow people to say, you know what, I'm going to designate a portion of my property as lawn. And everything else is no longer lawn. You don't have to mow it. There's nothing that says you have to mow your entire lawn and maintain it as lawn. You do have to maintain lawn as lawn. So if you designate 10 per 20 percent of your lawn or of your property as lawn, maintain it as lawn. Mow it, mow it three, four times a summer, five, six times a summer. Let the rest be what it wants to be or manage it uh, for the things you want to manage it for, and it can be simply pollinator habitat. And many communities have uh, started using sort of just visual signage to put on your yards to say like, hey, the reason my lawn looks so shaggy this month isn't because I'm lazy, it's because I'm doing a thing, right? I'm not doing a thing by doing a thing. Uh, <laughs> And so we have our little Nomo May sign here that, you know, we, we hand out to people in the community and we printed them up at like five bucks a piece. Uh, through the pollinators, a community group and organization. And, you know, the flip side of them are just like, here's some bee friendly things that you can do in your lawn. Um, you know, and you can check, do little check marks basically of saying like, oh, I created pollinator habitat or I reduced my herbicide and pesticide use or I considered other grass alternatives. So, you know, design something like this, make it a community <laughs> contest, have kids draw out a sign for your yard. All of those are really exciting things that we, we like to see and that communicate to your community saying like, hey, we're, we're doing this with a purpose. We're not just being lazy here. Uh, just real quick, I wanna jump in. Yeah, those cues to care, um, that's a term that a, um, a landscape architect, Joe Nassauer coined 
Um, and we actually, we talk a bit about that in our previous uh, Nomo May webinar, which I can link to in the chat. Um, and I just want to mention, um, certainly you, you're welcome to design your own signs. It's a great way to make this personal to oh. your community or get kids involved too. Um, but we do also have the um, city and the campus uh, logo Nomo and Lomo signs on the B City website. So if you're looking for, thank you, Matthew, uh, he just added that to the chat. So um, you can print those at home or you can, you know, just make your own and and borrow from what we have, all, all of our talking points on the Nomo May page that we have there. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that, um, could you guys touch on, I don't know if you're already ready going to, but um, could you touch on uh, passing the resolution and what barriers you faced and what changed and how do you build, build those relationships? Yeah, I'll, I'll start it off there. Um, so I came at this strictly from the, the science perspective. And I said, like, here's the science, here's the best available science. And a big part of what I like to do is just science communication and science education. And so I try to make that science as easily accessible as possible. Uh, talking to your local alderman uh, and then saying like, hey, you know, this seems like an idea. It seems like something we can try maybe as an experiment. Many communities pass this as a one year trial ordinance. And that's exactly what we did here in Appleton. We said, let's try it for a year and see what happens. It might be that, you know, all heck breaks loose. And then all of a sudden we have all these residential complaints and mice have overrun the city and ticks have taken over and everybody's got Lyme disease. <laughs> but that's not at all what happened, right? That's not even close to what happened. There was a minor, if at all noticeable uptick in lawn complaint, lawn grass complaints. Uh, there was no evidence to suggest that tick abundances increased. And so once we got the data behind that after a second year, it became relatively straightforward to convince our city council to, to, to make this part of our culture here in Appleton. Um, having said that, I also ended up being sucked into the world of local politics a little bit. <laughs> and so now, as a result yeah. of Nomo May, I ended up running for alderman to represent my district. And now um, the environmental, well, along with Alex, we're the environmental hippies on, on city council. <laughs> Uh, passing all these sorts of or proposing all sorts of ordinances like these. So the Nomo May initiative, I, I mean, I authored the resolution um, a few years back, and it came out of some of the work we were doing to allow uh, beekeepers to operate in the city and also institutions to have beehives. And after a few years of doing that work and working with Idril, who uh, kept hives at the uh, Lawrence University, uh, his suggestion to do this no more May initiative, he brought that forth. We authored the resolution, introduced that. And he's right. I mean, I think the way to do this in communities that are, you know, you might not have the support for is to say, look, let's do this for a temporary. We're going to do it for one year. Let's try it for a year. Let's make it temporary. We're going to go for one year. We'll see what happens. Look, if the community goes nuts and, and we can't support it, then we'll pull it. We won't do it again. And so it's important to report back after that year and say, like, oh, okay, look. Here's the this end of year happened. one. This is what happened. And so, and so when we when we proposed this for the first year, we had uh, lots of feedback from staff that was suggesting, oh my gosh, you can't do this. It's going to be, you know, <laughs> you're going to increase your citizen complaints threefold, fourfold. And what we discovered after the first year is that the citizen complaints about lawn grass increased by 15, 18%. It was a, a, a minimal increase in, in uh, the inspections department wasn't overwhelmed. Um, and after two years, essentially just became ingrained in the community psyche and like, okay, well, my neighbors got long grass, I guess they're participating, I'm not going to call into the city and say they got long grass. Now you're going to deal with, there are certain uh, citizens who are going to complain no matter what, and you and all have, the persons. and all the persons, <laughs> yes. And, you know, every community is a little bit different, you may have uh, a lot of landlords that are uh, you know, absentee landlords, and they may take advantage of the situation. So it really depends on where you are and, and the situation you're dealing with. But for the most part, I think we'll find uh, that what people think is going to be the sky falling is not going to be the sky falling. So, you know, you just, I think the way to couch it is, is what Isil suggested um, when you present it to council to get approval and say, let's do this for a year. If it turns to craziness then we yeah. can always rescind it and that's what we did for two years after the second year it was like look there's no issue with this let's make this permanent so we made it permanent in Appleton and now we're dealing with the next phase which I think everyone's gonna have to follow suit is like okay well we made this no more may thing permanent but really what are we dealing with now we have to think a little bit more uh 
strategically about what that means for our citizens and how they want to participate because everyone's law is slightly different and how they've taken care of it for the last 20 years or 30 years is slightly different. So everyone's approach is slightly different. And what we want to try to do is be a little pro proactive and say, okay, we understand that everyone's got a slightly different environment uh, on their lawn and on their properties. Um, let's give you some options on how to participate and just help you help you decide what to do, whether that's not mowing or maybe you're just raising your lawn deck. Maybe you're rowing, mowing the same with the same frequency, but instead of mowing at an inch and a half, you, you put four. your lawn deck to four inches. Mow the same amount, but let your grass grow a little bit taller. That's going to allow those flowers to bloom and and do kind of what we're we're expecting uh, those things to do early in the spring. So, you know, and 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 as we move forward, I think these things are going to be a little bit easier for people, for people to accept, and also for people to, for people to understand what their property does and what it means for them to manage it and how they can best manage their property. This is just an excellent community education opportunity. That's really, to me, the, the mowing, the grass and the no mowing and the dandelions that pop up, that's great. And that's benefiting our pollinators early on. But the big win, the real win for me as a scientist is that community education component and saying like, okay, we got you talking about bees now. Now you understand why pollination is really important. Why, you know, one out of every three pieces of fruit that you eat requires a, an insect pollinator why chemicals like uh, you know herbicides and pesticides that are out there are potentially harmful to these pollinators. We understand these bigger questions at play and we get an, a chance to communicate with our neighbors about it. And the other bit of advice that I have just in general is to, to have fun, just have fun with it. Try not to take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. um, yes, insect conservation is a serious issue. Yes, pollinator conservation is a, a serious issue. Absolutely, by all means. But use this as an opportunity to have fun. Alex and I, for example, last year decided <laughs> to uh, raffle off a lawn mowing at the end of at the end we of the, do it again. Yeah, we're gonna do it again this year uh, at the end of No Mow May. So you know, people bought raffle tickets for five bucks a piece, and if your name got selected. Uh, then we would show up and mow your lawn at the end of the month. And of course we did it in, in sexy honeybee outfits. Then it was very, very scandalous uh, and very, very sweaty, <laughs> but we had fun with it, you know? And, and, that, and that's the sort of thing that you want to do. Keep it light. Um, we understand that like people are protective about their property value. They're under, they're, we're understand uh, that you're protective about like what you've tried to cultivate, the status that you're trying to signal. All of that matters. But at the same time, it's like, it's a month. Yeah. It's a month. I grew up my beer during uh, November <laughs> for men's health awareness issues. It's a month. I cannot shave for a month. I could also not mow for a month yeah. and just fun and educate and engage, 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 engage the little ones. And, and I, I want to piggyback on that, right? Because you're talking about having fun and trying to engage your community, engage your neighbors. Don't, don't go into this like with sort of blinders on saying, I'm going to participate for four weeks. I'm going to go, let my lawn go crazy, do what it does. While your neighbors on the other side might be those who want to manicure to four inches and they're out there every like two weeks of uh, every twice a week mowing their lawns. You really want to be conscious of your neighbors, be conscious of the conversation. And that's why like those cues are very important. Like, okay, I, I understand that you don't want, I don't, you don't like dandelions, but I'm going to have it in my lawn. And honestly, I'm going to try and cut them down before they go to seed and like spread those seeds to your lawn. I'm, I'm, I want to help you. I'm going to be conscious. I'm going to do my thing, but I don't want to create conflict with my neighbors who might not be on board. And so that's really that's a really important part of this conversation is to be with your neighbors, have those conversations, you know, don't just participate by not mowing for four weeks and then, you know, allow what happens uh, with your lawn to influence your neighbors and have them be mad at you. We really don't want that to be the end result of this conversations. We want more beneficial conversations with your neighbors than we want conflict with your neighbors. So it's really important to think about what your lawn is doing. And so if you notice it, like going to seed and the dandelions are tall, don't don't wait. I mean, mow it down three weeks into May. And that's okay. You've you know, that's okay. You've already what? done some great work. You've already allowed your lawn to like be not be interrupted from its um, natural awakening in spring. Even if it's two weeks into May and your lawn is going crazy, you know, mow it at a certain height, bring it down. 
the, the point is to have those conversations, keep your neighbors happy, have those conversations, but not to create animosity and yeah. conflict between your neighbors. Cause that's the last thing we want. We're not going to move this conversation forward. That's the biggest if barrier to education. If all we're doing is creating conflict, we don't want to create conflict. And so you just need to be really conscious of that. Uh, if you're like a diehard no mow mayor and I'm not going to mow for four weeks, but you're going to create animosity with five people around you, that's not the best outcome for, for your the participation, right? So it's really important to think about that. It's important to think about grass clippings. We've had to deal with that a couple of years, the first year in particular, because if we had all these people not participating and suddenly at the end of the month, oh my gosh, where am I going with all these grass clippings? And your, yeah. your municipality might have a means of picking those up and taking them to the city. Um, yeah, it depends on where you are and, and what the collection, it's just you. <laughs> right. It might just be just you. So you can mulch them in. But if you've got honestly, if you've got a lot of green matter or uh, organic matter, it may not be wise to leave that all on your lawn. Right. And uh, so uh with that, like uh your municipality might have a drop-off site for your bags of of green waste. They might also, uh, if that doesn't happen, or we're, like our municipality charges something ridiculous, like two bucks or three bucks a bag. Four bucks four bucks a bag of grass clippings uh, to dispose of. But in that case, connect with your local community gardens. Mm -hmm. Turns out, guess what? Grass is rich in nitrogen. And what does your garden need in the middle of summer? Nitrogen. And so we use that as a composting opportunity, right? So again, we're using this platform of like, oh, now we have excess grass. What do we do with it? We educate our community about composting practices, about natural fertilizer, uh, moving that, that grass slowly into your garden to provide that extra nitrogen and boost for your tomatoes. And it all kind of comes back full circle. Um, so explore creative solutions like that. And I think you're going to be just fine. Um, we're getting, this. I just said, we're getting, we have about 10 minutes left, but we can go much later on our end if you, you three are willing to stay. Yeah, we're, yeah we can keep chatting. I'll crack okay. On. So, um, I, I was hoping we could chip away at a few of these Q and A's. Yeah, I would love to do that. I'm, I'll just start picking away some of these. I, I'm trying, I'm trying to do them as we go here, but I know I'm not doing a very good job of it. So you're, you're uh, hitting them a little, but I just want to make sure. Yeah. We, we yeah, hit the, the Q and A section. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of great comments and questions yeah. in here. Um, Photographic just... evidence of the bee costume mowing is forthcoming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get Be to sure that. to tag the ZRC Society and put it on social All right, media. so I'm going back to like 7.30 from uh, Delano. Where can we get signs that say no mow April? Uh, wow. uh, we have those on the Bee City uh, No Mow May Lomo Spring page. If you go to the bottom of the page, we have social media content and yard signs for Lomo, Nomo May, Nomo April, and Lomo Spring. <laughs> Fantastic. Lots of options. The next comment was from Richard Solberg, who said, don't forget to include a water feature in your pollinator habitat. Yeah, These so. need to drink too. Brilliant. I, yeah. Uh, and one of our, our paper, actually, one of our papers just got accepted today uh, for publication in the, again, an open access journal uh, called uh, PLOS, Proceedings of the uh, Library of Science, PLOS One on managing urban bee habitats. And one of the big things that we find in that paper is that that water is really important for urban bee biodiversity conservation. So those water features go a long way. The next one was from Amy uh, Meltzer. Advice about lawn or landscape care after the emerging flowers and insects have come out beyond May. I would say essentially try to try to do the same thing, try to uh, reduce the frequency of mowing or maybe the, the mowing height. You're going to help them have more opportunity for forage and habitat. Um, maybe Israel will have more to. You know, in reading more of these uh, urban landscaping papers, I'm, I'm not an urban landscaper. I'm not a landscape or ecologist or a, well, a landscape ecologist is something completely different. Anyway, uh, uh, an urban landscaper. Uh, and one of the things that folks criticize largely is that cutting your 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 grass from such an aggressive height at the end of May will cause your your lawn to be stressed and harmed. Uh, and that's certainly true. Think about like losing half of your bio biomass or three quarters of your biomass in one go. Uh, that's very, very stressful for for the lawn in in, in any particular situation. However, we have noticed that lawns are resilient in a lot of ways. They bounce back. 
you know, you might get a drier looking lawn or a stressed looking lawn for a week or two post no mow May, but in general, most of these lawns have been coming back pretty healthy and pretty strong. My neighbor right next door. So I have one of these lawns like Alex that's super shady and stays super low. So I never really have to mow anyway. But my neighbor next door has been fertilizing for years, manicuring. And of course, now he participates in no mow May, but his grass gets to about <laughs> two and a half, three feet tall. And you so know, I'm out there with a like an actual sickle, <laughs> like hay farming at the end of May with Don, and uh, and it's great. I mean, we have a, we have a fun time doing it and whatnot. But his lawn at first, uh, it was very very patchy from where you know his dog used the restroom over the winter months, uh, and it piles up here in, in in Wisconsin winter. And it turned his lawn pretty patchy. And after no May, we realized that those patches were gone. So much of it had gone to seed that it actually refilled and reseeded itself, which was kind of a cool thing to see. I'm not saying that's going to happen in every case. This is just strictly anecdotal. Uh, but there are potential benefits of, of doing that. Yeah. And then also remembering that when you're when you actually are staring at, say, 12 inches of grass, there's there's no reason to go from 12 inches to four inches right away. So doing yeah. this in steps, you yeah. could mow it down a, a few inches, no more than a third is generally what a lot of turf specialists will suggest. Wait a day or two, um, and then you know continue to go down slowly. Um, and that makes sense kind of intuitively in terms of how nature responds, so yeah. gentle approach. And I hate to say it, but like no mow is not for everyone. Um, there are folks out there that still use push mowers and that's great. I, I love, like Relena used a push mower for many, many years. And we're thinking like, oh, wow, how are we going to mow your lawn with a push mower now that it's 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 this height? And it's just it wasn't practical. Right. Um, so it's it's for it's every individual's choice. And and oh, that's the other really big thing. This is make this strictly voluntary. Yeah, definitely. this is a voluntary effort. Okay, Nobody's going to find you if you mow your lawn in the middle of May. That's not the goal here. That is no, there's no mowing or bee police out there that's out to issue you a citation or a sting. It's like we are out there to no, that's it's entirely voluntary. If you continue using your regular mowing practices, by all means, we embrace the diversity of lawn care practices. I think that's a really important aspect as well. Um, so do what's practical for you. And don't worry, it's not a mandatory thing. Yeah. It's a totally opt-in voluntary option. We have a, a question about um, invasives. Um, and I was just going to quickly say that we advise that you follow your local laws about invasive species. Um, we're not saying to allow some highly, like we're not saying let the knotweed go crazy. You know, we <laughs> kudzu is not something we're trying to harbor. So you are welcome if you are participating to go through and hand weed out the problem weeds, but many of the things we call weeds aren't actually weeds. They may be native plants or something that's basically naturalized and not and considered a very low priority in your mm -hmm. state's um, invasive species listings. So I would just keep that in mind. Yep. That That's an excellent point because, you know, every municipality and then it goes, goes to the state okay. level, we have an invasive species list. State has theirs. Uh, municipalities might have a few more additions to that invasive species list, but uh, you know, if you pass a normal May ordinance, it doesn't preclude the invasive species from being uh, allowed. So you might let your lawn not grow and you might not mow it for four weeks. But if you have Canadian thistle or some other invasive species that grows beyond uh, a certain height, you, you might get dinged and, and, and inspections has every right to come and say, you know what, that's on the invasive species left. You got to get rid of that. So yeah. that's one thing to be conscious of if you... I would, you know, familiarize yourself with what's invasive in your area and then just be mindful of it. If you let your lawn grow, you might find things like burdock or Canadian thistle growing kind of crazy because you know, they go you've fast. seen Canadian thistle grow. It'll be three or four times the height of any bluegrass that's growing on your lawn. So yeah. that was an excellent point to be to be brought up. Um, I see lots of so questions about signage and where to get them and how to how to find them, um, you know. It, we, we've done signs for our community and, and a little bit beyond that. Uh, Xerxes, of course, has done a, a series of signs. You can order them there. You make your own. You know, anything. Just put something in your lawn that suggests that you're participating in this, ex, this natural experiment. Yeah, uh, and this it is... doesn't have to be anything pre-produced. There's tons of options online. Even like 
we support our bees or we're feeding the bees. There's all kinds of options for you to, to yeah. create some signage that tells people what you're up to. Um, and, and I, I think mean, it's a kind of lucky situation. I get to work with like an artist every day, right? I, who designs and does graphic design. Yeah. But this is also like opened up the community to chatting with my neighbors and knowing that like, oh, one block over, Michael lives over there and he's, he's, also, a he's also a graphic fantastic. artist, fantastic graphic design artist and he's into pollinator conservation. And so he'll, you know, put in a couple of hours of work to help us design something clever. So don't be shy to talk to your community. That's, that's a big part of this is just open your doors, talk to your neighbors, talk to your neighborhoods about what's important to you as a community. So I want to, I want to take up Gerald Thornton's question is if I stop mowing our Bermuda grass, lawn it will become a sea of bermuda grass choking on everything should i try to kill it before going to normal i don't know if any of us are I don't, I'm not professionals on answering that question but it sounds like a pretty tall aggressive grass that's gonna kind of grow and, I mean, and fill out the space i might consult like an extension service so many universities have an extension service that specializes in in kind of plant turf care plant and turf care um, but then you could consider something as, as simple as overseeding, which I only recently learned about, where you would mow down the grass and then add in a, a mixture of additional like lawn seed that you would want. And so that wouldn't necessarily convert it entirely away out of Bermuda grass, if that's your goal. Um, but it's a way to introduce additional species so that over time, your lawn can kind of naturally uh, migrate to a greater diversity. Yeah, we've had the full spectrum of restorations of lawns from slow, gradual reseeding which is very, very accessible. When you mow, you can just rake up, rake some seed into it, and that's great. Uh, that's worked great with Clover with a couple of neighbors here. Uh, but we've also had the full extreme of the other end where folks put entire black tarps on their lawn for a full year, and they said, no, we need a full reset. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes a year, but you can reset your lawn that way, and it is very aggressive, and it's not going to be good pollinator habitat <laughs> for, a but, for a while. <laughs> yeah. But down the line, you can replace it with something beautiful. And we want people to understand that, again, I, I don't know why I'm feeling like very flowery and, and like <laughs> communicated and it's probably the couple of beers that I've had, but uh, no, my, my point is that like, we want people to embrace the possible, that beauty isn't just one possible thing, mm -hmm. right? It's not just this perfectly manicured golf course. That is beautiful. Yeah, I like it. I like sitting and having a picnic on a grassy patch. But we also want people to consider that beautiful looks like wildflowers popping up everywhere, restoring native biodiversity back and welcoming insects that play important roles in our lives back into our urban spaces. And, and then really understanding that bigger story and communicating that story to your community is a, a big part of the process. Yeah, really, really questioning what it means to be a weed. You know, what are weeds and you know, what are their benefits and not benefits and why are we calling them weeds? So we have a question about uh, our fertilizers used for lawns harmful to pollinators. Um, this is from uh, if Elena Irwin. And uh, I would say it depends on the nature of yeah. that fertilizer, whether it's non-organic or organic. Um, it's a really hard question to answer depending on what it is. And, and part of what we're trying to do in Appleton at least is reevaluate uh, sort of the, de, you know, the de facto approach to people putting weed and feed and fertilizers on their lawns in the spring. And like, what are you putting on there and why? Mm -hmm. Is it absolutely necessary? Do you need the insecticides? Do you need the herbicides? Yeah. What are you trying to accomplish? And so that's, that's the other benefit of this conversation. I mean, if you have a poison lawn and you're letting it grow for four weeks, you're, you're just creating a poison a habitat for these bees that we're trying to support. So not only is it important to participate and no mow, not mow your lawn, but it's probably even more important to consider what you're putting on your lawn when you're not doing no mow, whether that's in the fall or spring, adding these uh, non-organic chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers that have a latency period of five to seven years in your lawn. So you might, I'm great, I'm participating in normal, but you've just created a, an environment where you're probably not benefiting those things that you're trying to benefit. So again, it's this, it's, we're, we're starting to get into the more nuanced conversations with people about, okay, what exactly are you doing with your lawn? And what have you been putting on it for the last 10 years? How are you treating these spaces? Maybe this is some things that you should consider, maybe try something that's a more organic uh, 
or approach. And there are organic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers that you can put on your lawns. And so that's part of the broader conversation that we need to start having. And I think that's what this is leading to. The next step of the No More May initiative is, okay, let's really think about what we're putting out there and what we're trying to accomplish. So if we change what we're trying to accomplish, which is the conversation, what are you trying to accomplish? Do you want a monoculture lawn that looks like a fairway? Or do you just want like a greenscape that's healthy and producing habitat and forage opportunities for pollinators? Then that's a different conversation. Because right. if that's the thing you want to do, then here's your approach. But if you really do want to have that uh, fairway, four inch monoculture lawn, then you can also have some other options. You don't have to be using or, uh, non-organic chemicals that are harsh to the environment and poisonous. There are other options for you. Right. You can do these other things that can still provide you with the lawn that you want to have, but maybe not are contributing to the, the harmful ben uh, harmful things that we're doing to our environment on those lawns. So again, and it's a nuanced approach and everyone needs to start thinking about these and having these conversations instead of this sort of black and white, I just want this lawn or I don't. And when it comes to fertilizers, this is an opportunity to think about like the complexities of ecology and the interconnectedness of ecology. So I, I right now I'm teaching uh, an intro first year study or first year uh, ecology course to our freshmen in, at Lawrence. And one of the big things I, I like to talk about is this interdependence and interconnectedness of different systems. So even though we're working with pollinators, at the same time, by applying some of these pollinator conservation practices like reduced herbicide use or chemical use, we're impacting other components of the ecosystem. In this case, soil restoration. Soils are incredibly important. We want to build up healthy soils. We want to build up biodiverse soils. We want to build up soils with really rich bacterial communities. And that's like totally Relena's domain. So I'm not going to jump in there too much. Uh, she's the soil scientist. But, you know, by helping bees, we're also potentially helping soils. And so exploring that, it's by having these one off events or these uh, reduction of inputs of, of chemical herbicides and pesticides, then we're really having these uh, downstream and upstream effects throughout the ecosystem. So if anybody has seen Ant-Man Quantumania, that whole biosphere underneath our feet that they project with like this crazy <laughs> universe, that's what's happening underneath our feet. There's so much that we don't know about. That you don't see. You, you ignore it. If you don't see science. it, you ignore it. None of us ever think about it. We don't contemplate it. We just assume that what's above the ground is what we're trying to do, but everything we do affects that soil biome. And there is a world, a, a universe, a multi, whatever you want to call it. Think about, if you want to picture what's happening below the grass, that's what's happening below the grass with every, I mean, I, you guys can speak more to it than I can. And it is spring a tales, my, and we, and we, know, and we know what, maybe a 5% of what's happening down there in, in our in our scientific understanding of what's happening beneath our feet. So those things are incredibly important and, and we don't think about them. So this is also the conversation to start thinking about those things. Uh, yeah, kind of thinking about your, your lawn or even a neighborhood park is actually, you're con continuing to be involved in this process of land stewardship. And, and that doesn't need to be a passive process where you're continuing legacy effects of whoever was tending the landscape or the landscape before you, but there's there's real reason to kind of lean into caring for the land around you and thinking about that stewardship angle. Um, and a lot of the organopesticides and chemicals aren't natural to that environment. So when you're introducing these sorts of things into even the water systems, some of those downstream effects are, are well known and characterized by ecotoxicologists. Um, but kind of thinking about like the principles of only applying what you need um, as, a, as a bare minimum. We use this for fertilizers when you're fertilizing your garden. So kind of thinking about that same principle applied to your lawn. And it might make sense for some folks to, to simply stop fertilizing altogether and plant in clovers, which are fantastic nitrogen fixing plants anyways, which is a whole cool system in and of itself. Um, the, the various organisms that depend on having a diverse array of below ground microbial counterparts. So fungi, bacteria, archaea, we, we know a great deal about these organisms, but we're still scratching the surface. Um, and to, to know that you could be helping promote the habitat for these cool. organisms cool. by engaging in things like not mowing your lawn, changing the different lawn care practices, talking with your neighbors and engaging with your community to kind of think about stewardship at a, at a bigger picture scale mm -hmm. and recognizing whatever piece you're doing is, is helpful. 
Yeah, and, and that's actually a really nice segue to one of our comments that mentioned, well, what about compromising? Uh, you don't have to go no mo everything, right? Uh, what did one of my colleagues call it? Uh, I think she called it having the the mullet lawn <laughs> where it's business in the front and party in the back. Yeah. Uh, and you can just, you know, let the back row out uh, and while the front yard looks pristine. And that's a great way to do it. That's 50% increase of pollinator habitat right in your backyard and nobody has to know a dang thing. Um, and so, yeah, you know, get creative. Think about what you can actually do in, in within the space and the constraints of your city ordinances. So Richard asked a question or made a comment. Israel can go on as, as long as the beer doesn't yeah. run out. And then, Wisconsin. <laughs> and then hopefully he does supporting a local. I will attest that he is supporting a local microbrewery, mm -hmm. which I also do. So <laughs> I just want to answer that question quick. Uh, Who's also actually quite connected in yes. the Noma endeavors. Absolutely. So kind of finding those community partners for you is also a great move. Yeah. Right. We bring our, our honey, for example, from our research hives to McFleshman's Brewing Company, and we brew a special beer at the end of May to celebrate mm -hmm. no the more. end of Nomo May. Mm -hmm. And so it's, again, have fun with it. Engage your local partners and engage your community with it. Uh, we're going to pick this one up. This is from Patricia. What do you think of the research that suggests that mowing every two weeks promotes greater bee diversity and abundance than not mowing for that whole month? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. That might be Susanna Lerman's study. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, there's a lot of really good science out there. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the big things that's really cool about ecology is there's so much variability and so much noise in the data. Right. And so my other hat besides ecologist is data scientist and understanding the statistics that go behind a particular study. And what I love about the Lerman lab over at, at uh, the U.S. Forest Service is that, yeah, they've tried some of these alternatives and they found slightly different patterns. Maybe for Massachusetts, it's every two weeks. Maybe for Wisconsin, it's every three weeks. Maybe for Ontario, it's every month. It really, I think there really is a strong geographic signature here that we don't fully understand yet. And that just tells me that there's more exciting science to do yet. You know, science is an iterative process. We're going to keep asking these questions and fill in the puzzle as much as we can along the way. So if you're in Massachusetts or maybe New England, two weeks might be your recipe. And I trust the science of that particular region, just like I would trust the science of the folks in the Northwest or the down in Southeast, mm -hmm. wherever you are, look to your local scientific research community to see what the best practices are and engage with them uh, to, to try and apply those rules. Yeah, and I uh, just want to mention real quick, uh, Matthew, who he, he had to depart, um, but he um, put together this nice little um, list of summaries of published studies uh, of conservation benefits of reduced mowing. So these are um, uh, some of these are meta uh, um, what's it meta analyses. So um, it'll it has information on multiple studies, but this could be a good launching point for uh, people looking to go deeper into the science. Totally. Laura, any other questions you want us to tackle today? We're gonna keep we'll, we'll keep working through this quick. Uh, Amy is ways for lawns to support more biodiversity through the growing season. Yeah. yeah, diversity. diversity <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thinking of, of connecting with maybe master gardeners in your area, because this is a, a big thing offering different floral resources or even color and variety throughout the season is both like aesthetically pleasing. It's really interesting to see these different perennials blooming up, um, but it's also a really great idea to kind of integrate and think over the phenological season. So kind of tracking what's happening in terms of flowering dates and times mm -hmm. to see what's appropriate for your area. And I would say master gardeners would be a great stop yeah and if your goal is you know to eventually replace all your ornamentals with natives that's a great goal but there's also recognize that there's also nothing wrong with having a hybrid mix if mm -hmm. you were to step out into my front yard right now my grass would be shaggy but you would also see some daffodils popping out there and you'd also see some tulips popping out there um and i'm not saying that's just because i'm doing it it's the right thing to do i'm just saying it be amenable to some compromises along the way be amenable to say try a hybrid approach of mixing your natives with your non-natives uh having color in your yard i just mm -hmm. i like a colorful yard i like a yard that says like look there's life here 
There are there are tulips here and there are irises here, but there's also goldenrod and there's also cornflower and there's also coneflower. And it's just a mix of things that really ultimately, I think, in my opinion, maximize biodiversity in your yard. So it looks like Anthony had to make a compromise with his wife because she suggested he failed and uh, that he should consider actually planting an edible front yard instead. Which hey, I love it. Yeah. Yes. Plant the whole yard is edible. Yeah. Yeah. Plant the garden. That's the other thing. We need to get back to sort of a victory, victory garden aesthetic here where we're taking some of our uh, potential green spaces and maybe creating our own opportunity for our own food sources. So it's not part of the normal May conversation, but it's certainly part of the conversation about what we can do with the available property that we have and the green spaces that we have. Why not starting to grow a few tomato plants, grow some peppers, grow some stuff to help you harvest I mean, I've got a really small plot of uh, property on my and my house. I don't have a lot of space for these sort of things, but I have a fantastic uh, blackberry vine that I've been growing for years. And I actually made like five quarts of blackberry jam year, last year off of this kind of insular, isolated blackberry vine, which yeah. I love. So no matter where you are, there's always opportunities to do these kind of small things. Yeah. Herb gardens, mm -hmm. um, tomatoes, whatever you want, small gardens, bees find some spaces. Bees love basil. Bees love uh, buzz pollination through for our, our tomatoes. There's squash bee that pollinates our squash and all of our cucurbits. So pumpkin squash, all of those are dependent on bee pollinators. If you're into growing fruit trees, your cherries, your almonds, your apples your pears are all going to have have uh, some strong some sort of benefit by associating with a, a native pollinator so my my tip there is also to just get to know the bees in your backyard um it might be that you know you have a lot of ground nesting bees in which case the nomo lack of disturbance goes a really long way or it might be that you have leaf cutter bees and there's strong signals of those semi-circles cut out leaves in your yard and they're building nests in little cavities along the way. Get to know what's in your backyard and what's ultimately gonna benefit the pollinators in your backyard. Um, every, every place is gonna be different. City of Appleton here, we have about a hundred different species of bees. Uh, state of Wisconsin, 400 species of bees. United States of America, 5,000 species of bees. So it really, really, really matters where you are and what pollinators are in your backyard and how to best manage for them. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to require bare patches of ground that are just sandy soil. Mm -hmm. Maybe an old sandbox could do the trick. Mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of things go, you know, just plan for what's in your backyard. I really want to read this next one by Michelle Collip because it's pretty cool. Pretty incredible. I spent four years convincing my city to change their noxious weed ordinances. Daisies, milkweed, and goldenrod have been illegal to plant. It took four years to convince the city all to align with the state's noxious weed list. Now it is legal to plant goldenrod, milkweed, and daisies. Wow. Congratulations. Oh, That's important. That is fantastic. Persistence. Yeah. Did they say what state they're in? I am, I do no. not see that. Okay. Uh, if she's still listening. That's wonderful. Yeah, because I know, um, yeah, Michelle, if you're still with us, let us know what state. Um, I know Kansas has had some issues. Um, I forget which city, um, with uh milkweed, though though they are passing uh policies at the city level to protect monarchs, enforcement on private lands isn't on the same page. So yeah, there's a lot to be done with making sure that some of the language and expectations of enforcement match where the policymakers want things to be because one thing you may encounter with these city with um nomo and lomo practices is that enforcement may not match the letter of the law and it may be more that's what they think they're they're just like um uh the their expectations may be one thing versus what the actual law requires so it's good to know what your policies actually look like on paper and if they can in fact enforce those laws and if there are laws that prevent you from making having a more natural landscape then you can look at changing those policies potentially <laughs> i think it's incredibly important that you know we're actually looking at what the noxious weed list is because these are, are these are lists that are created by legislators and you know dnr, DNR or whatever whatever department so maybe it's worth reevaluating those at a certain level and i mean i it's I, I, stunning to me that milkweed would be on a noxious weed list but i mean i guess depending on where it is i, I can see why that would happen but mm -hmm. yeah certainly it's worth uh all of the work that is required to to take a look at 
you know, your state's noxious weed looks, and then look at what's on the list for your municipality, because it may include some things that maybe shouldn't be on there, or maybe there's something that's not on there that should be. So good work, really good work. Now a quiet spot because I'm reading. So somebody yeah. wants to well, in. while you're reading, I want to. Um, we have a question from the Q and A section. Um, someone asking uh, how many no mo groups like yours are in the U.S. <laughs> We'd love to know. Hours? Please email us. Yeah. Email us. Let yeah. us know if you've done no mo in your community. I'm currently compiling a list, and as of today, our list was at around 65, 70 different communities and small towns, villages, all the way to big cities like Milwaukee, Detroit uh big cities participating as well so it's the full range and i don't know if that question was about the cities and, and communities that are participating or if you meant like the pollinators group um i'm not are... sure yeah, okay, so yeah. If, in case it's about the the pollinators group i i also still would like an email from anyone who knows that these groups are in existence because i think kind of networking and collaborating will will help kind of expedite some of the information sharing when there are new scientific results to share Mm -hmm. uh, Vic asked, do municipal buildings participate as well in applicants? So we're, we're working on this. We're working on it. Yeah. So uh, we, in Appleton, we're fortunate to have uh, a, an organization and uh, city leadership that has been doing lots of great, um, I guess I would call it sustainability, sustainability initiatives, and they do a really good job. Yeah. To yet, they've, they've not embraced no may no more may as we'd like to mm -hmm. have them embrace it, but they've always they've always been looking towards opportunities in all of our city parks. And we have a lot of green spaces um, to sort of reduce mowing, uh, mulch in what they are mowing, and they they do a pretty decent job. But uh, we just a few weeks ago introduced a resolution to take a really prominent city park uh, and introduce it as a no more may park. So we're hopeful that that'll pass and that we'll have this really prime sort of centralized location for people to understand oh the the city's behind this as well it's not yeah. just this community organization or this normal may organization and it might not necessarily be the entire city it might be your business uh so Relena and I both work at Lawrence University and Lawrence University this year is participating in Nomo May but again we've reached a compromise they're not going to do the main hall green where, you know, we have right. graduation and visitors walking through campus, but they're going to do about 60, 70 percent of the rest of campus. That's uh, and that's, that's huge. That's a huge win. And that's like, OK, we're not going to do it in a very obvious way, but we're going to be there with you and, and participate along the way. On a follow up question, uh, there is no public list. Heather asks about a public list of entities that are committing to the initiative. Um, yeah, not uh, yet. Yeah. Coming, hopefully coming yeah, soon. I think we're in the process good. of of centralizing all of our Paul enablers and Nomo into a common website. Uh, so hopefully that'll be available here within the next month or so. And one thing to keep in mind too is some cities don't need to do anything to participate, so they may not publicize. They might just say, "Yeah, you can do it if you want to." <laughs> And then others may be doing a variation like no mo month. I'm seeing more and more. Uh, so it, the language can be harder to pick up on as far as finding out who's doing what. <laughs> well, that's all the Q and A questions I have. Uh, do you have more in the chat you want to answer? Yeah, I'm just I'm kind of going through the chat, looking at some of the additional comments. Uh, some questions about composting, mm -hmm. which I think is a, a wise thing. If you can compost, do it. If you want to mulch it back into the yard, I think that's that's an okay thing. I guess my only my the only caveat to that is left you if you let your lawn grow for four weeks and you have a significant amount of uh grass biomass. clippings, yep. biomass, essentially be, probably don't want to let that sit on the lawn. That might yeah. create opportunities for other insects to take and advantage just, of it. And just in our stores. experience, community gardens have been the answer there. Yeah, so we've worked with at least three or four community gardens and they're like, yeah, we'll take your grass clippings, no problem. And we'll we'll mix them right into, into our mulch and compost for larger scale operations. So so essentially we'd suggest you know, compost, but maybe at a larger scale. Well, yeah, mow if your lawn gets really tall, mow no. earlier than the end of May. You know, maybe it's two or three weeks in, or maybe it's you know, two weeks you do eight inches, mm -hmm. the fourth, fifth week you do you know, four inches or something else. Try to ease your lawn into it. Don't just create a a, a situation that you got to deal with. But if you do let it go and you've got a lot of biomass, try to find a space for it and not leave it sitting on your lawn. 
um, or compost it, which I do myself. I compost most of my clippings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think which we'll is go, just real quick, I think we'll go another seven minutes and then we'll close it out at uh, 6.30 in my time. <laughs> just going a few more comments here. Good, man. I think we're pretty good. See what the three new messages are. Yeah. Oh, we got, I got to go way down here. Sorry, I was stuck with the messages. Public entities committed to the initiative. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Presentation. Uh, and then what was the last one? That was just, yeah. Okay. Just a reminder while you two are looking at those, um, we do have examples of no mo, no mo and low mo resolutions on the B City No Mo May page. Um, I just pulled, I think, four examples. But also, if you just Google No Mo April or No Mo May, whatever you're looking for, Google it in quotes. Um, and then the word resolution <laughs> or maybe ordinance. Um, that's a fast way to find some good examples. <laughs> so, is there anything else you wanted to hit here? No, thank you guys. I really appreciate the audience. Appreciate you all participating, coming by and learn a little bit about how Appleton has done business. But you know, every community is going to be different. And I wish we had one one size fits all sort of solution. But at the end of the day, this boils down to a lot of communication, a lot of patience, some grace, and making sure that we, you know, are empathetic towards our neighbors and just try to build a stronger community together. So. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, just, you know, very generalized notion that, you know, just let your lawn try to be your lawn. So just let it do what it's going to do, you know, take care of it as need be for uh, your neighbors. but. Try to let it be what it wants to be and we'll see, and, and see what happens. You'd be surprised what comes up and what pops and kind of things. Um, right. Final thoughts? I'm just thinking, let it let it be. I hope let that the um, <laughs> auto caption generating is also filling that in with emojis of ease. <laughs> let it be is a great lawn, yeah. lawn slogan in general. And lastly, I, I want to thank Anthony for his comment. Here's a link to nine environmentally friendly beers you can enjoy this Earth Day. So that's really what I want to end on. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thank, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Cersei Society. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Really thank, appreciate it. Thank you. you.